Storms Church, I want to declare over you right now that you are above the storm. Ooh, yes, sir. Thank you. Let me, let me just say that because I think only a couple of you got it. But I'm going to declare over you that you are above the storm. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I'm glad that you're here today. I want to welcome you to New Covenant Church. If this is your first time visiting with us, I pray that you got a little blue bag or a, a pink bag if you're a woman. Inside those bags, there is, uh, there is a visitor's card to fill out. We do not pass an offering plate. Tithes and offerings are between you and the Lord. And so we, we advise you to fill out those visitor's cards and place them in the black boxes that are hanging on the wall. And uh, we would love to reach out to you. We welcome those that are viewing us over the live stream right now. Just like all of those that are sitting inside this building, I declare over you that you are above the storm. Amen? You are above the storm. I want you to say that today. I am above the storm. Okay, now say it like you really mean it. I am above the storm. I titled today's message, Now What? Now What? I think a lot of times in our life we probably ask that question. Now what? What am I going to go through next? What am I facing next? What is the next struggle that I am facing in my life? Now we ask ourselves, I don't know if you've asked that, but I've even said that out loud. When I go from one struggle to the next struggle, and it's like, it's like, have I not gone through enough struggles? Have I not faced enough mountains in my life? Have I not faced enough giants in my life? And I'll say, now what? What next? What is the next attack? Man, and that's, I, I know that doesn't sound very spiritual. But that's the humanity side of me. Because we get tired. It's, it's kind of like the Apostle Paul. When the Apostle Paul said, uh, was talking about the, the thorn that was in his flesh. And he said it was like the, the messenger of Satan was sent to buffet him. Like to, to hit him in the face. Just to smack him. Every time he tried to get up. It's like the enemy was there to just hit him right in the face. And to knock him down to the ground. And then we find ourselves at some place. And we say, now what? Now what? What's next? And I'm here to tell you, just as I told this declaration, you are above the storm. Whatever that giant is in your life, you are above it. I've already spoken it in the prayer, Isaiah 54, 17, that no weapon formed against you will prosper. But listen to this. The continuation of that is that you will silence every voice that is raised against you. Somebody needs to say amen to that. Come on. See, it's not just about declaring that no weapon will form to, formed against you will prosper. It's not just about speaking those things, but it's actually believing and knowing what the Scripture says, that you will silence every voice that has risen itself up against you, and it will not prevail over you. I, I, come on, church. I mean, I'm asking here. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to, if we are going to decree and we're going to declare these things over our life and say that we are not above the storm, then we've got to begin to walk them out. And, and, and here's the thing, and I posted this on Facebook, and I didn't, I didn't post this specific scripture, but I posted reference to it. In James 1.12, every trouble that we face is an opportunity for our faith to grow. Amen. But you see, all the time, we as, as people... We say, I don't want my faith tested. I remember when Tina and I, well, it wasn't really me. It was all, she raised our kids. I, was, <laughs> I wasn't there. I was working. I was where I it wasn't that I was an absent father. I was just working. Uh, but but she was she, uh, her patience was tested tremendously, uh, especially when the boys were were little, the twin boys were little. And and so and a lot of times she was like she was like, God, give me patience. God, give me patience. Oh, well, but, but, but patience comes with testing. And it, there eventually came a point where she finally just started saying, I don't want no more patience. I don't want no more patience. But you see, here's the thing is, is that every trouble that we face, every mountain, every storm, every giant that we face in our life is an opportunity for our faith to grow. Yes. Yes, absolutely. 
Y'all hear? Is this microphone working? Very well. You wearing your hearing aids this morning? Don't need them, huh? <laughs> Amen. You know, as I was as I was studying and I was reading through scriptures and I was like, I was like, rising above the storm, what are you saying in me? And over and over and over, I, I've, I've, I've heard this scripture in Isaiah when it says that we can, we can on wings like eagles, soar above the storms. And I, and I, and I studied, I, I went in and I, I studied about, about eagles. And I was like, what sets an eagle so much apart from every other bird? And, and when I studied about it, and I didn't know some of these things, but, but the lifespan of an eagle is anywhere from 50 to 70 years, okay? And the thing about that is it, it's 100% dependent upon them. You see, really and truly, the average lifespan of an eagle is about 30 years. But something happens at about that 30 to 40 year mark in an eagle, they get to the point in their life where their talons are no longer strong enough to hold on to the prey that they're going after. And their beaks began to turn downward to make it difficult for them to, to eat and to attack like, they, like they're supposed to. And something happens inside of them that they can either say, okay, this is it. This is all there is for me. I'm just going to go ahead and die. Or they make a choice to make change in their life. In other words, they submit themselves to something that a lot of us don't want to go through. See, there's a, there, is a, there is a cutting away of the flesh of our heart that is required to happen. There, there, is a, there is an actual tearing away of the things that do not glorify God. See, the, David said in the Word, he, sa he says, turn your searchlight on me, O God. And what he was doing was he was saying, expose anything in my life that I could lay down before you and say, I want this to come under the blood of Jesus. I need this to be removed out of my life because it's hindering me from being, oh my God, who you want me to be. So many people in life, in the church, are not being successful. They're not doing what God wants them to do because they don't want to crucify mm, the old man. If you could hear what I'm hearing right now, I don't have an earpiece in. There's no one talking to me other than the Holy Spirit. But I'm telling you right now, and somebody needs to hear this. You are, not be, you are not being victorious in your life. <laughs> oh, come on. I can't say that. Okay. You're not being victorious in your life because you refuse to surrender control. Listen to me. The eagle, the eagle beats its head. Now, I'm not telling you to go beat your head. But the eagle beats its, its beak until it breaks it off. It, it, in, in, in old age, it, it begins to grow down, and it's like this. And it gets to the point to where it's curling under. It bangs its beak until it breaks its beak off so that it can grow a new sharp instrument. Wow. It also rips out its own feathers. It, it claws its own feathers off of its body because over time and throughout age, its feathers become so matted together that it hinders its ability to fly. Y'all need to hear this. I'm telling you, you need to hear this message. Some of us, <laughs> some of us need to go through the fire. Some of us, some of us need to do some tearing, some ripping of the flesh. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not telling you to go out there and hurt somebody. That ain't what I'm saying. 
You're, you're, you're a violent little person, you little package there. Don't go out and hurt nobody or yourself. Uh, this is not some cult thing. I'm not saying, you know, you got to do, no, that ain't what I'm saying. Now listen, in the spirit, I'm telling you, we need to tear. We need to rip. That thing that we've been speaking, I'm no good. I'm not good enough. I'm not living up to the standard. You need to get that garbage out of your mouth. Listen, listen, Isaiah said, I live amongst, I live, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. I'm telling you right now, you need to let the, you need to let the Holy Spirit take the coal off the altar and let him burn the things out of your life that are not bringing glory and honor to God. Somebody needs to hear this because we stand before people every day and they are listening to the, wor the words we're saying. They see the actions that we are doing. And if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to send those things in my life, if I don't allow the Holy Spirit to burn the things out of my life that are not bringing glory and honor to God, I'm going to begin to walk in my own flesh. And I can tell you today that it is detestable to God. It is foul in his nostrils when I began to walk in my flesh and not allow the Holy Spirit to guide me. You can rise above the storm. And see, here's the thing is that eagles are the only animals, they're the only birds that do not hide in a storm. All other birds, all other animals, they go and they hide. They, they find shelter. But the eagle doesn't do that. The eagle allows the power and the strength of that storm to carry it to heights above the storm. It doesn't even have to exert very much energy. When that eagle sees that storm coming or senses that storm coming, it begins to fly straight towards the storm. And then it allows the force and the pressures of that storm to cause it to soar up and over and above the storm. It does not allow the storm to dictate its life. How many Christians, how many people today, either here in this building or watching me today, are being dictated by the storms in your life? Under the control of the storm. God did not call you and me to be controlled by the storms that are in our life. He called us to rise above those storms. You are the head and not the tail. What is your confession today? Are you the head or are you the tail? Because the Word of God says that you're the head and not the tail. What is your confession? What are the words that are coming out of your mouth? Soar above, not beneath. I'm going to carry you to 1 Samuel chapter 17 today, and I'm going to show you something in the Scripture, and I pray that you see it today. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see, we see here that Goliath is challenging the Israelites. Somebody's, somebody's phone is ringing. Hit, hit the thingy on the side, the button. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, and, and I'm just going to read very rapidly through these verses of Scripture. You can follow, but I want to give you an understanding of what I'm, where I'm heading with this. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, I'm going to read through verse 11. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Succoth and Judah and Ezekiah at, at whatever. Saul, uh, Saul countered by gathering his uh, Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on a opposite hills with the valley between them. I want you to keep in your mind that the enemy will always get in your face. <laughs> the enemy will always get in your face. Then Goliath, and Philist, the, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, a bronze coat of mail that weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor. He carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. 
The shaft of his spear was as heavy and as thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor, bear, his armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted a, a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then he will, we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Verse 11 says that, the, that Saul and all of the armies of Israel were terrified. They were so gripped with fear. Have you ever heard that? That, that they were so terrified they couldn't move? That's kind of the situation that they were facing. They were petrified. They could not move because of so much fear. Here's the thing. Did you notice all the details the details about the enemy, how big he was, how big his instruments were, how heavy they were. The enemy always causes us to focus on the details of him being victorious over us. That's what the enemy does. The enemy always puts out the details and causes us to be gripped with fear. They were focused on the taunting. They were focused on the words that were being spoken by the enemy. And it caused them to be gripped with fear. I remember... I remember when I was, when I was uh, back in, in my welding days and I was a welder... I worked this this particular job, and it's especially early in my walk with the Lord, I, I was I was taunted all the times. Words were constantly spoken against me, constantly spoken down. Oh, you're you know you're no good. This is uh, you're you're just going through a fad. You're just going through something in your life, and, and you'll get over it. But on the job, I was being taunted by the enemy. The enemy was using people on the job to pick and to poke at me as a child of God and who I have confessed to be. And I remember but because uh, back in those days on my hard hat I would have scriptures written on my hard hat and people would poke at me about the scriptures that I had written on my hard hat. But I continued to be faithful. I continued to walk according to the word of God and to trust God that he'll vindicate me. I remember I was out in the field and I was making a weld. And I had just, I had just finished making this weld and, and I, had, I had my file out of my bucket and I had cleaned the weld up and I, I had just stenciled it, put my, put my signature to that weld. And the owner of the company drove up. And when he got out of his vehicle, he walked straight to me. I doubt he knew what he was looking at, but he looked down at my weld and he said, you did that? I said, yes, sir. He said, that looks good. There ain't no way he knew what he was looking at. <laughs> but after the owner of the company drove away, the superintendent on the job called me over to his shack. Back in those days, chain shacks were allowed on the job. I walk over and I, I get in to the chain shack and I sit down. And the superintendent on the job says, I don't know what so-and-so thinks about you. And I don't really care because I hate you. And I had done nothing to the guy. But he straight out to my face, not three foot away from me, said, I hate you. And I just smiled at him and said, I'm going to be praying for you. And he said, oh, by the way, and I don't remember the exact dollar amount. I think it was $2 an hour. He said, 
so-and-so just gave you a two dollar an hour raise and I said well praise God and I walked out of the shack and I went back to work are the taunts of the enemy affecting you or are you standing fast are you worried about what other people are saying about you or are you going to stand your ground as a child of God Because you know what the flesh wanted to do? The flesh wanted to fight back. The flesh wanted to cast a comment back in, in that person's direction. The, the flesh side of me wanted to cast hurling fireballs toward all of those that were making sneers and comments, whether it was at lunch or whenever I was walking by. Yeah, there goes that Christian guy or whatever. The flesh side wants to attack. But I wanted you to see this because when we look at, at, these, at these words that, that are being hurled, they, in verse 11, when it says that, it says that, that fear had gripped Saul. Fear had gripped the Israelites, and they were terrified. They were petrified. But David, here's the thing, is that David was anointed to be king. Isn't it interesting? And David and, 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 and God even told Samuel, he said, He said, Samuel, you look on the outward side of man, but I look into the heart. You see, here's the thing. God knew that David was going to fall. God knew that David was going to do the things that David did, but he still called his anoint he still had Samuel anointing to be king. Because he said, David is a man after my own heart. I'm not telling you here today that if you trust God that you're not going to fail. Because you will. I'm sorry. I'm not speaking condemnation over you, and I'm not prophesying failure in your life. I'm just saying that Jesus is the only one that walked this earth without sin in his life. But right here in this verse of Scripture, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, in verse 26... David was having conversation with the soldiers that were there. He was asking, he says, what, what will happen? What will, what will be given to the person that kills this Philistine? I mean, this is a 16-year-old boy. This is a 16-year-old shepherd boy. Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? I'm here to tell you today, stop allowing the enemy. Stop allowing the enemy to work in your life. Stop allowing the enemy. I hear people say all the time, I just don't know why I'm going through this. I just don't know why I'm always getting beat up. I just don't know why I'm always mad. I just don't know why I'm always failing. I just don't know why I'm always going through dot, 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 whatever it is in your life. Stop allowing the enemy to control your life. A 16-year-old boy walks up on the scene and says, Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Amen. And immediately, David receives verbal persecution from his own family. Verse 28, when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. The spirit of jealousy. Yes. Because, see, Eliab was the very first one that stood before Samuel. Eliab was the very first one that his father brought before Samuel and said, Surely this is the king. And it's also noted in history that the oldest is the one that receives the blessing that's handed down from generation to generation. I'm sure that Eliab was probably had some resentment built up in his heart yes. against David because David was the youngest. And he got overthrown by the oldest. I mean, the oldest got overthrown by the youngest. 
So I'm sure there was probably some resentment there. Probably. No doubt about it. He says, what are you doing around here anyway? What about those few sheep that you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about the pride and the deceit. You just wanted to see the battle. And David says, what have I done now? You know what that tells me? This ain't the first time that he got ridiculed by his brother. What have I done now? This is probably from the very time that David was anointed to be king, he was probably picked on and ridiculed by his older brothers, specifically Eliab. Because he said, what have I done now? What is it that I have done now? David could have retaliated with, let me tell you something, I'm the one that's anointed the king. Do you understand that? You need to be bowing down before me. He could have done that probably. I don't know. He wasn't king yet. He was anointed to be the king, and in God's eyes, he's the king. But Saul was still alive, and David wouldn't dishonor Saul, so David didn't take the throne until Saul was dead. Don't you think David could have attacked how many people would have? Just be honest. How many people would have verbally attacked him? Oh, y'all are holy. Okay. Wow. Look at David's response. He goes to the king. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. I'll go fight this I'll go fight this giant. I'll go fight this storm that is raging against the children of Israel. I will go out and I will soar above the storm. I will be the one. Look at what he says in verse 45. I'm not going to go through the, the, the talking back and forth that David and Saul were having. But in verse 45, when David stood before Goliath, says, David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel. I wonder, I wonder if there's anybody here today that's tired of the enemy taunting you. I wonder. I wonder if there's anybody here today or anybody that's watching us today. I wonder if you would be willing to stand against the giant. No matter how big the giant is, no matter how big his weaponry, weaponry is, I wonder, would you be willing to stand against the giants in your life? I think that if we stood more often, we would see less people being controlled by the situations in their life. Amen. You know what we do? We do, we do what was spoken of earlier in 1 Samuel 17. We start giving statistics. But this giant is nine feet tall. But this giant wears this coat of mail that's 125 pounds. But this giant has a massive spear that he can attack us with. This giant is so big and so mighty that he's got his own armor bearer that carries his shield for him. That's what we do. Instead of speaking about how big our God is, we tell everybody how big our enemy is. Yes. I wonder how many Davids are in this room. I wonder how many Davids are watching us today. I wonder how many Davids will rise up and say, I'll go out and fight this enemy, and I will be victorious over it. But you see, immediately we see Saul... Just like it's explained about, about how big and bad Goliath was, we see Saul telling David, you can't go out and fight this. You can't defeat this giant. You're just a boy, and he's been a man of war since he was a boy. Saul was so defeated in his mindset 
by everything that the enemy had been taunting. It says that every day the enemy would stand out on that hill and look Israel in its face and taunt Israel. You can't defeat me. I mean, the armies of the Philistines, they probably didn't even get out of the rack. They, they were probably laying in their racks all day long playing on YouTube or something. They were, they were probably playing video games all day and they let Goliath go out and taunt Israel, taunt the children of, of God. They didn't, even have to, they didn't even have to muster a sweat. Because Israel believed the lies. They believed that they were not bigger than the giant. They believed that they could not conquer the giant. I wonder how many people here believe that you cannot overcome the storm in your life. I wonder how many people here today believe the lies of the enemy and say that I cannot beat this thing in my life. I cannot overcome this situation in my life. I wonder how many people will rise up and be a David today. I wonder how many people will soar above the storm. I wonder how many Christians are sleeping in their tents. Have you ever heard, has anybody ever uh, watched Discovery Channel? Y'all watch Discovery Channel? Anybody? Animal Planet? Have you ever seen a study on, on lions? Why is a lion called the king of the jungle. What, why is a lion called the king of the jungle? The lion don't even live in a jungle. Seriously. Lions are actually in, in Africa south of the Sahara Desert. And the north, I think it's either it's the northwest or northeastern parts of, uh, of uh, India. Why is it called the lion of the jungle? Or king, I'm sorry, king of the jungle. Because it shows everything around it, its power and its authority. It believes that it is more powerful and stronger than every animal out there. The lion is not the biggest animal. Don't you think that a, don't you think that a, an elephant could stomp a lion if it wanted to? But yet an elephant is scared of the lion. You know, what the, you know what the lion's number one enemy is? A hyena. A hyena. A hyena is the only animal that will attack a tribe of lions. Is that retarded or what? You know how funky and small look, you know, a hyena is? Have you ever seen a hyena? I mean, they're... they're little bitty things but they're ferocious and they believe inside of them that they can beat the lion now they can't because the lion stomps them the, I, I read a story I read a story I'm going to close with this I read a story uh, about a, uh, a pride of lions see a, a tribe of lions is, is, is called a pride so I, I read this story about this, this pride of lions and um, these hyenas attacked this pride of lions and, and it, was, it was a bunch of lionesses see and I don't know if you know much about lions but, but lionesses which is the female lion is the one that goes out and gets all the food and gathers everything and and, and brings in the food to the pride to feed the cubs and even the daddy lion. Kind of reminds me of my house. Uh, my, my lioness, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but this, w one of them, Animal Planet, or, or one of them was following this pride of lions for quite some time and they noticed that the male lion was absent and usually prides of lions or, or, or tribes of lions there's usually two or three male lions and about could be as many as 15 lionesses that are a part of this pride of lions and then of course all the little cubs that, that are a part of this pride well Obviously, these, these hyenas had been watching 
these these lionesses and noticing that the male lion was was not there was not present and one day these hyenas attacked this pride of lions now let me you are going to have to hear this these hyenas overthrew the lionesses and took some cubs some little lion cubs and no matter how much the lionesses fought against the hyenas, the hyenas, even though they were a far less superior in size and strength animal, they were controlling the situation and they were hauling off the cubs from the, from the tribe. In fact, the hyenas were, were in full run carrying the cubs away and the lionesses could not catch them. And then out, out of nowhere, the lion, the male lion comes running out from undercover. And with a swift movement of his claw, took out the legs out from underneath one of the hyenas that had the cubs. And that hyena went to flipping and flopping. And the lion roared with its loud voice to let everyone know that he is the king. And I'm here to tell you today that there's a lion inside of every single one of you that calls yourself a child of God. There's a lion that roars with power and with authority that lets everyone else know around you the king of kings is on the scene and no weapon formed against you will prosper no enemy can rise up against you and be successful because that lion of the tribe of judah lets everyone know around you that you will not bow down to that storm that you can rise above the storm that you find yourself in because he says you can soar on wings like eagles I don't know how many of you needed to hear this today. I don't know how many of you have been walking defeated. But I want you to know today that there is a lion that will not bow down to any enemy. His name is Jesus. My, my word, my Bible... My Bible tells me that in Romans chapter 8, according to Romans chapter 8, I am more than a conqueror. What is your confession? As I said before, in, in Isaiah 54, he says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Are you being defeated in your life? Deuteronomy those that follow the Lord will rise above he said I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you that's what Jesus even said when he was ascending to the Father when he gave the commission to go out and to tell everybody he said lo I am with you always even to the end of the earth seeing a lot of people all around this nation right now that are walking defeated, beat up by the enemy because he's, he's sent out his little hyenas. But there's a lion that will come out and rescue you. There's a lion that will roar and let the enemy know that he's not as strong as he thinks he is because he's already been defeated. 
I don't know what you've been speaking over your own life, and I don't know what you tell other people when you're not around here. It's real easy. It's real easy to praise and to jump and to shout. And it's real easy just to, to glorify God in the midst of all, a bunch of other believers. In fact, we should come together. He said, let us not forsake the assembling. It's important that we would come together and that we would draw from one another strength, that we would draw strength and wisdom. He says, iron sharpens iron. But when we go out and we get in the community or we're in the grocery store or we're on the job site, what do people see? What do people see? They see you hollering and cussing, acting like a fool. Or do they see the lion of the tribe of Judah rising up inside of you? Is there an opportunity for you to witness? Or are other people saying, man, I need to witness to that person? <laughs> I'm just here to tell you today that there is a lion that wants to rise up. And you can soar on wings like eagles and rise above. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord God, that we don't have to bow down to the enemy. I thank you, Lord God, that I thank you that I can make that confession, Father, that no weapon formed against me will prosper. And just like when David said, I'll go out and I'll fight this enemy because I don't go against this enemy in my own strength, but I go against this enemy in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. Father, I praise you. I praise you, Father, that it's not my strength, but it's yours. I thank you, Lord God, that in my weakness, you will use it and you will bring strength into my life and you will get the glory. God, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I thank you, Lord God, that your word is powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. God, I thank you that your word will not fail you. God, I thank you that your word will return to you and it will multiply into your kingdom. It will do what you sent it out to do. God, I give you the praise and the glory that I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. God, I give you praise. I thank you today. I thank you, Lord God, that I can submit to you and I can surrender everything under your control. I can walk victorious. I can walk out of this place today. Anger will not control my life. Envy will not control my life. Fear does not control my life. Whatever it is that is in your life today, you know what it is. Every single person in this building knows what these, what these things are. And I say today, lay them at the altar. Lay them at the altar today. Give them over to God today and allow the shed blood of Jesus to wash them out of your life. You don't have to have someone touch you or lay hands on you. You can go before the Father yourself. You can say, Father, I am here. He said, come boldly into the throne room of grace. He didn't say, get a ticket and have someone come with you. He said, we can come boldly into the throne room of grace, that we can find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Father, I speak victory over this place. I speak victory into the lives of every person in this building today. That when they walk out of this building today, that when they turn the live feed off today, Lord God, that we will know that you are for us and our enemy has no chance. God, I give you the praise and the glory for what you're doing in this place and what you're going to continue to do in the mighty name of Jesus.